Let us read. And the children of Israel journeyed and encamped in the plains of Moab, beyond the Jordan at Jericho, and Balak, the son of Zippor. So all that Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was so afraid of the people because they were many. In other words, they were, he was afraid of Israelites because they were many. And Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now will this multitude leak up all that is round about us as the ox leaketh up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of Moab at that time. Verse 5. And he sent messengers unto Balaam, the son of Baal, to Pitho, which is by the river, to the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, they say, people, there's what? Come out from Egypt, behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, cast me these people, for they are too mighty for me. Per adventure I shall prevail, that we may smite them, and that I may drive them out of the land, for I know that he whom thou blessed is blessed, and he whom thou cursed is cursed. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you. God of our father and mama, God of Abraham, God of Charis, for your weight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I said our topic is don't fight wrong battle and don't criticize anyone. We are reading a, a very sad story according to my understanding. The reason I said it's a sad story is because um, somebody who was king of Moab was intimidated because of the multitude or the great number of Israelites which he saw. Tell somebody and say, when you see something, don't conclude. Remember, Israelites were not in this land to fight anyone. In fact, they were on their way. They were on their what? Going to a promised land. So the moment he saw them sojourning there, he just concluded that these people, I saw what they did to Amorites. So they want to do the same thing to us. So his, the Bible said, he sent a weight and the messengers to a place called Petho where he was going to call the prophet Balaam to come and curse the children of Israel so that they can be destroyed because of fear. And his fear was fear of unknown. Hallelujah. So his fear of unknown made him to conclude that these are the enemies that must be cursed because he realized that he cannot fight them and conquer because there are many. So he said the only way to destroy them all is when the weight of the prophet of a curse, I mean to say, can be released to them and then they can be finished. So the Bible said as the, the man received the news that he has to travel a long distance to come and curse the people of God who are raised and blessed by God. The Bible said he, the angel of the Lord visited him. The angel of what? Came to him and say, you must not go and curse the blessed ones. It means if you go, you'll be fighting a wrong battle. But he insisted to leave and go. The Bible said when he was on the road, using his donkey to travel, he was surprised all of a sudden the donkey stopped. It could not carry on moving. 
So he had to fight the donkey to say, I know this donkey of mine that wherever I tell it to go with me, it will make sure that it takes me there. But today I don't know what's wrong. The Bible says there was an angel of the living God in front of the donkey, which he could not see, though he was a prophet. I don't know if you are hearing me. The Bible said now, the donkey, because is now facing two challenges. The, challenge, the first challenge is the donkey must take the master to go and curse the people whom he is not supposed to curse. That's the first challenge. And the second challenge is the donkey is facing the angel which is having the sword. And this man cannot see this. So the donkey is between two people and the donkey must decide. So God realized that the animal will die for nothing. It's better I open the mouth of the animal to inform this man that the, the person now you are fighting or the animal you are fighting now is not good. You are fighting the wrong battle. And the assignment you are going to perform in Moab is also not in the will of Almighty God. There are many people who are busy they look like they are saving God. They look like they are doing everything for the glory of God, only to find that they are not even appointed by God. Preaching every day, doing all, but you find that God is not involved. That's why the Bible says that not all who say, Lord, Lord, will see the kingdom of Yes. So we must not miss a point. Tell somebody and say, no more wrong battle. No more. As the man was still surprised of the donkey, he heard the voice of a human being speaking from the mouth of the donkey and say, my master, I've taken you to everywhere you wanted to reach and go, but why today are you fighting me? And the Bible said, God opened the eyes of the prophet to see what the donkey is facing. That's when he realized that I'm going to curse wrong people. Say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. And, no one and no one can curse me. Can curse if you read the book of Luke, chapter 17, from verse 1, it's a one. Let's read it. Luke, chapter 17. Verse 1. Are you there? Luke is in the New Testament. And he said unto his disciples, this now was Jesus talking. He said, it is impossible, but that occasions of stumbling shall come. But woe unto him through whom they come. It were well for him if a milestone were hanged around his neck. And he was thrown into the sea. I want to read the same verse in King James. In King James, it says, Luke 17, verse 1. It says, And he said unto his disciples, It is impossible, but that occasions of stumbling. No, it's not what I want. I want King James. Sorry. Where is King James? Yes. King James says a different story. I want us to read King James. King James Version. Yeah, here we go. This one is speaking the same story. King James is, he says, Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible that, but that offenses will come. But who? unto him through whom they come are you seeing the verse so verse 2 says it were better for him that a milestone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones here jesus was addressing his disciples which is also today addressing us he said, it is impossible for offenses not to come. But who unto the one who bring them? 
So it means there are offenses everywhere that must come to offend you, to offend your heart, to offend your marriage, to offend your finances, to offend everything about you. You must see those offenses, you must hear them, and you must know that this offense is mine. But the Bible says, who unto him who bring them? Are you hearing that? So if now there is a wrong battle here, which sometimes is that in the mind, you can look at somebody and finish, conclude that this person is my enemy, only to find that you are wrong. Because you can be offended by wrong judgment. You will see somebody and wrongly judge and conclude and become offended, only to find that you are bringing the offense to yourself without any reason. So the Bible says, they must come. It means offenses should be there, but no one must bring them. No one must offend you. You shall be offended, but no man must offend you. Are you hearing me? So it means this offense is here, which Jesus is talking about, will be brought by Satan. It must not be brought by anyone, because the moment you bring the offense, you are fighting the wrong battle. The moment I offend you, maybe I accuse you of something that you haven't done. Already I'm in the wrong assignment. Hallelujah. The Bible said in the book of Corinthians that though we are in the flesh, but our warfare is not carnal. It's mighty through God. Can we read the verse? Let's go to it. Corinthians. Hallelujah. I believe you are writing those verses down. Are you writing them down? Yes. Second Corinthians. Before we read Second Corinthians, let us read Ephesians chapter six from verse ten. I'm talking about wrong battle and don't criticize. Verse ten he says. Finally, my brethren, be strong. Be what? In the Lord and in the strength of his might. Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God, that he may be able to stand against the walls of the devil. For our wrestling, our fight, our war, fair, our battle, is not against flesh and blood, but against the what? Principalities, against powers, against the rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Wherefore, take up the whole armor of God. One of the reasons why we can find ourselves in wrong battles, criticizing one another, is because we are not strong in the Lord. The Bible said, my brethren, finally, be strong in the what? In the Lord. Don't be strong in the feast. Don't be strong in weights. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The Bible said, when you are like that, you are not finished. You must put on the full armor of God because there is a battle that you have to fight. So when you are wearing wrong, you know, attire, you might not conquer. You might concentrate on the wrong side or fight the wrong battle. The Bible says you must put on the full armor of of God. When you read it da going down, it says, the first thing you must have, helmet of salvation. Helmet of what? Salvation. The second one is a 
We must have the breastplate of righteousness. We must have shield of faith. We must, you must put on your loins truth, the belt of truth. And the Bible said your shoes must be shod with the gospel of peace. And you shall be able to conquer all the fairy darts of Satan. Because what we are fighting against is not flesh and blood, but is principalities evil powers kings of darkness spirits in the high places so you need to put the full armor of god not half full armor of god hallelujah Amen. full armor of god peace truth righteousness salvation and the bible said our mouth must be ready to speak the word of God, which is the sort. So it means when you speak, devil must hear and he must flee. Remember the book of James, it says, we must humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he will lift us up. It's first Peter. So James, it says, when we humble ourselves to him, we will be able to cast him and he will flee hallelujah Amen. but if we do not have the full armor we will try to cast he will just satan will just take few steps and come back because he will be seeing the weakness maybe there is righteousness but there's no peace maybe there is peace but there's no salvation maybe there is shield but there's no sword Maybe they sword, but there's no shoes. Are you listening to me? We have to put the whole armor of God. The whole what? Hallelujah. When you are engaged in the battle, the Bible is telling us in the book of Timothy that anyone who is a soldier or anyone who is in a race running must abide by the rules of that particular marathon because you can be disqualified. So the Bible says when you are a soldier or you are, you are appointed for a certain job to do, the one that we have to please is not audience. It's not people who are ululating, leaping hands for you but the master who has appointed you. So, if you listen or you focus and concentrate on people, you might not make it. Because you might be discouraged maybe by seeing somebody that you know is hating you, is also there among the audience, and you know this one is my competitor. Because not everyone who is your audience appreciates you. Somebody might be there when there is noise of urulation, when they are clapping hands, you find that there is one or two who is among the crowd of those who are congratulating you, but that person is not doing anything. Is there to check your failure is there with the red pen marking whatever you are doing when you are congratulated the person will say but there is this mistake that i know when you are getting married the opposer will say but she had a baby before the wedding i don't know if the husband knows the moment you say, I want to buy a car, but they said, but we remember when he was arrested for drinking and driving. There are always opposers, always competitors, but we don't focus on them. Hallelujah. Amen. We focus unto the one who said, you will make it. Amen. Let me get three people I want to give example of how jesus work three okay three animals 
Three people, thank you. Yes. Uh, only pastors, okay. You will face me, all of you, and then what? you come here, sir. Yes. And you, behind. So, the one that you have to concentrate on is the one who is calling you. The one who is doing what? Let me get four people. Four. Two here, two on the other side. Two here, two there. Yes, two, two. You, have, you two, you face him. Come, stand here. Come closer. You are concentrating on this man. You also are concentrating on this man. And whatever that he does, okay, you must also respond. I'm not saying you must make noise because you are still in church. So now, come say, you turn. You look at him. So this now is Jesus who said, my son, my daughter, come, you will make it. Do you remember the Bible says Jesus is omnipresent? So Jesus who is here is the same Jesus who is at there to beg you up. I don't know if you are listening. So now Jesus will say, my son, I went through the same trouble. Come. Stop there. And then here, Jesus will say, My son, I'm begging you up. You can't fail. Are you listening? So it means Jesus here is pushing you to your destiny. And Jesus, omnipresent here, is, is pulling you to your destiny. And there are these ones who are watching and they are saying, who is Titus? He was born next to Pumulani Mo and there's nothing good which can come out of Nazareth. Are you listening? Yeah. And they are talking louder because they are being pumped by the enemy. These ones, they are standing with these two. They are four. And the moment you concentrate, the moment you change your focus, you look here, you will think the one who is standing with you is only one person. Because here is two, here is two. And they are talking louder. They are saying, remember, you don't have metric. Remember, you were raped. Remember, your parents are this. Remember, they, they talk loud and they have all your stories. They have your biography and your bibliography. These people, one, two, three, four. And this one is saying, your past is cancelled. So the reason why Jesus will stand in front and pull you and be at the back and pushes you. So here, he's cleaning away. Do you remember the job of John the Baptist? He came to open a way for Jesus. Hallelujah. So this one is opening a way, is Jesus. At the same time, he say, I'm also cleaning your wrong footsteps. If there are any wrong print, footprints, I'm cleaning them. Yeah. Push him. You will make it. You pull. You pull him. You pull him. You are pushing. Can you see what Jesus is doing? Yeah. And these ones, they are also there. Hey, where you are going, you will never make it. Hey, remember, there is this. Hey, remember, there is this. And Jesus said, I'm cleaning all your wrong footprints. And here I'm making a way. So now, the moment you concentrate on these ones, there must be a delay. There must be turmoil. There must not, there's no breakthrough. Because this one's come closer. Tell him stories. T talk. Talk. Who are you? And you talk also. Who are you? I won't be 
Can you see? So he doesn't know who to listen to. They are talking at the same time. So when this one say you won't marry, this one say you won't make it, you won't, you won't buy a car. There's no car that, that suits you. You don't have a license. So he, he will, you will be confused. That's why you are confused sometimes. Another thing. There are these ones who are, these ones are in front of his eyes. Okay? There are these ones who are closer to his ears. So, these ones are talking in the ears. These ones are talking in front of him and he can also hear the voices. Can you see there are many? So, this man can end up being, conv being convinced that these people, they are standing with me. It is true. I was born in a poor family and no one has ever bought a car. So what is it that I'm trying? Witches will kill me by accident. And here Jesus said, here Jesus said, come say, thank you. Here Jesus said, there's nothing like that. Anything you want, you get it. Anything. God bless you. So the moment you are, your focus has been taken or shifted, the first thing that will happen is disappointment. Two, you start to cry. Three, you lose all. But when you focus unto him, you realize that he does impossibilities. He brings them to be what? Possibilities. You will always be surprised. But how did I make it? And the Holy Spirit will always say, by the grace. There was a man who was an apostle, eventually. His name is Paul. The Bible said one day, he had a pain on his side, crying every day, Lord, please heal me, remove this pain. And Jesus answered after he prayed for so many days. Instead of Jesus answer, you know, removing the pain, because he's asking God to remove the pain, Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for you. That's how he understood that, oh, in fact, I was concentrating on the wrong thing. Tell somebody and say, you must have focus from today. A small pain can make you to cry the whole week and you forget to pray. A small pain can make you, you know, to pray wrong prayers. You start, you start to scatter your neighbors only to find that it's just a test. The Bible said in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 12, 13, it says, when we are tempted... We must not say we are tempted by God because he cannot test anyone. And he also cannot be tempted. So any temptation which comes to you, according to the first book of Corinthians, it says God will wait first. And God will also weigh you are, you know, your capability and say this kind of test it's good enough for him for her and here when that test comes you start to cry the whole day you forget that there's no temptation or any test which can come to you without being checked so any test which comes god has checked it is good for you and the grace of god is sufficient Amen. for you. Amen. Can I get one? Yes. So now, if we can read the book of Second Kings, chapter two, from verse two. Second Kings. Second what? Chapter. 
Best? Are you there? Let's go there quickly. Second Kings, chapter 2, from verse 2. It says, let's start from verse 1. And it came to pass when Jehovah would take up Elijah by a whirlwind into heaven, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal, and Elijah said unto Elisha, Terry here, I pray thee, for Jehovah has sent me as far as Bethel. And Elijah said, As Jehovah liveth, and as thou so liveth, I will not leave you. For they went down to Bethel, and the sons of the prophets that were in Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Don't you know that Jehovah will take away thy master? from my head today and he said yeah i know it but hold up peace let me stop there 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 was a long journey which elijah the prophet had to take the bible said he was traveling from gilgal to bethel from bethel to jericho from jericho to jordan so he was with Elisha, whom one day he called and said, you must follow me because you are going to be my successor according to the commandment of the Lord. So Elijah knew that I'm going to die. And because he was a well-known prophet, there are also sons of the prophets who knew that God will take him one day. But little did they know when and which specific day God will take him. All they knew is one day God is going to take away Elijah. Hallelujah. Amen. When they moved from Gilgal, he said to Elisha, stay here because I still have a long journey to go to Bethel. Remember Bethel is a place where Jacob saw God and he built the temple of God. Hallelujah. So he said, I'm going to Bethel. So I want you to remain here because this is a long journey which I perceive he was using legs. He was walking. So he said, I'm going with you. When they reached Bethel, the first person who was tempted there was Elisha, the one who was following. And Elisha did not have the revelation that one day he has to succeed Elijah. All he knew was he's going to be anointed as the prophet. But not, little did he know that he's going to be in, in the you know, shoes of Elijah. So the Bible said as he followed, there came not the prophets but the sons of the prophets came and said, don't you know Elisha that you are master? shall be taken by Jehovah. He said, I know, but all I'll do is to follow him. The Bible said they moved from Bethel, they went to Jericho. When they moved from Jericho and go to Jordan, another sons of the prophets came with discouragement and say, don't you know that your master shall be taken? He said, I know and I will follow him. Now, because Jordan was a big river, and this man knew that God has to take him where people will never see. And the one who must see him is the one who must receive double portion. So they have to leave the sons of the prophets on this side and cross on to the other side. The Bible said he took his mantle, he hid the water, the water was open. When they were on the other side, he asked me a question. What do you want from me? He said, I want the whole portion of your spirit if you are willing. There are things which God wants to do for us if we are willing. 
If you are willing, God is ready or is ready. You know, it's long term, it's not long term that I landed. There are two kinds of things which are hanging in the atmosphere. Number one is a curse, number two is a blessing. There is also eternal life which comes, and there is also condemnation which is already written and said. The Bible says anyone who believes in Christ is already in in the life. The person is in the life and the life is in him. The person has eternal life. So the one who rejects Jesus, the Bible says, already is condemned. So the moment you do something wrong contrary, there is a case which no one will send. It will just fall on you. Hallelujah. And when you do the right thing, the blessing is ready to fall on you also. So what I'm trying to say is, God is ready if you are willing. Let's carry on. The Bible said when they are on the other side, if he is willing, he can release. And this one is also willing because he has been following to receive. He said, the moment you see me, so he started to give him some signs of saying, if you see me, if this thing happens, you're going to receive. Hallelujah. Now, there came the chariots of fire, which divided them, and the whirlwind came. He was taken, and the mantle fall, he took it. So he had to go back to face the same challenge of his spiritual father. Remember, the spiritual father faced the challenge of Jordan and he opened the water. So it's in him now. The spiritual father is gone. But he remembered what he got. He said, I have something in my hand. Ask somebody and say, what do you have? He used what he has, which he received for the right battle and he opened the water. When he reached to the side where they are sons of the prophets, they said, we want to help you. The very same people who knew that Elijah will be taken. So when they see Elisha coming back alone, they say, we want to help you, sir. Allow us to send 50 men to go and look for your master. Remember, these people, they cannot be able to open Jordan. But the question is, where are they going to look for Elijah? Because Elijah was taken by God on the other side. It means they, are, they will look for him on this side. Will they find him? No. So all the time, there are people who will be appointed to sort of helping you, only to find that they are taking you astray. So he said, okay, carry on, because you want to do it. The Bible said they went and searched for the prophet for three good days. They came back and said, we didn't find him. He said, I told you. But they insisted again to say, we want to go and look for him. The very same sons of the prophet. He said, no, I'm not part of you. He left. When he reached Bethel again, there came temptation. The first temptation was, remember these people were discouraging this man from following. Now their water is killing them. The Bible shows that their water is causing miscarriagement. So they come to him and say, that our water is sick. Can you please heal it? He healed the water. Tell somebody and say, if you are fighting me, tomorrow you will look for me. The very same sons of the prophets, now they are looking for solution from the very same men. They were fighting and criticizing. Tell somebody and say, don't fight me. Because I might have your solution. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Because, you know, there are solutions which sometimes they don't come from God. Can I give an example? If you want to buy a car, do you go to heaven? Where do you go to? And who do you meet? A salesperson. So, your solution is in the hands of a salesperson that we have to meet at the garage. And when you ask for a car, you don't go to a garage and say, I'm asking for a car in Jesus' name. You ask from, but God will supply using somebody. 
So, most of our solutions, they are available here, but we are fighting those solutions. That's why we have endless problems. You look at this one, you fight him, you criticize. You look at this one, you say you undermine the person, you fight. Only to find that God can put your, the, your solution in the hands of the very same person, and you will have more problems, more problems, and you will have no solutions because you are pushing your solution away. But one day, you have to meet and collide somewhere. And the person must sort your problems out and break your pride. Sometimes we think we can make it on our own on earth. And the question is, why are we so many? Why do we have Asia? Why do we have Africa? Why do we have... It means we need each other. If we can check most people who are in this province now, they came here for gold. Hallelujah. So since we came for gold, now we made homes here. We made everything here. And by the grace of God, God now brought charis. And we all entered through that door. We, I came alone. You came alone. But the moment we start to know each other, we form what is called a forum, an organization of fighting the person which I also met in the church. Ask somebody and say, what are you here for? If we can know why we are here, we will know who to fight. Tell somebody and say, stop fighting the wrong battle. I've seen I'm not saying unions are bad, but I've seen unions who stand for workers, mostly um, the union cannot exist if there is no worker. So workers must be in the factory, they don't know each other. This one came and said, give me a job because my children are dying by hunger. This one will, go, will come and say, give me a job because I want to buy a car. We meet with different reasons. But now when we start to know each other, we said, let us fight our employer. He's wrong. He's what? And we forgot that we all came through interview and our reasons were different. But now we start to complain. And you find that you also sign an agreement of saying, I will accept this kind of payment and you also say I will accept this kind of responsibility so when the responsibility they started to be much according to your understanding you start to fight I remember I was working with other men who, who was given about four responsibilities one day he said he cannot do it he's tired and he immediately remembered that when he came he signed a contract of saying he will drive the forklift he will drive the crane, he will help there, he will also operate the saw. So when he has to do all that jobs at the same time, he said they are too much. Fighting the wrong battle. He forgot why he's there. Tell somebody and say, don't forget why you are here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Let us read the very same Second Kings. We read verse 15. Verse 15 it says, and when the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho over against him saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth the rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. I like this one. When people are fighting you because they are engaged in a wrong battle, they will bow. I'm saying they will bow before you. Amen. They will bow before you. Amen. Because they will realize that you are the one to give them solution. They will bow. In Jesus' name, they will bow. Amen. Tell somebody and say, if you don't rectify yourself now, one day you will bow to me. 
Because I will be having your solution. The Bible said the very same people who oppose this man. You know, sometimes you, op you can oppose somebody who is in his obedience. You oppose that person. You will fight that person. Wrong battle. Wrong battle. You will fight the person. You will forget that there is a day of graduation. There is a day of what? When the person graduates... Everyone, even those who do not know the person. Because there will be cameras, there will be live services, they have to celebrate. And most people will, will want to know, I mean, those who are good, will want to know, how did you make it? They will ask other people which are maybe attending the ceremony and say, how did she make it? Hallelujah. Amen. And the wrong ones will bow. Amen. The wrong ones will bow. The wrong ones will bow. In Jesus' name. Amen. When they realized that the solution of their problem is in this man, the Bible says they bowed before him and worshipped him. They don't, they even forgot who to worship. One day, Paul healed a certain man. After healing, they brought sacrifices to sacrifice to Paul. The Bible said they even gave him, gave him a name of their God. So Paul said, I'm also a human being. He ran to the crowd among them and said, I cannot be worshipped. They realized that Paul has the solution for all their problems. Hallelujah. Amen. When you have a solution for many people, can I tell you this? Check how many people are opposing you. Check how many people are fighting you. Check how many people are criticizing you. You must know that you are carrying the solution of many nations. Amen. If you have a calling of God and you are not sure and the pastor start to fight you don't fight back just know that you are above the pastors maybe God wants many pastors who must submit to you that's why they have to fight you they have to fight you when you are trying a business and there are many business people who are fighting you don't worry it tells you that your business is bigger than their business. Amen. They must come tomorrow and inquire, how did you make it? Others, they won't even know where to buy their products. They must come and buy from you in Jesus' name. Amen. Because you are the solution. Amen. Tell somebody and say, my friend, my friend. I, am I am the solution. In this, nation. in this nation this nation, this nation must, know me. must know me not because of pride, not because of pride. But, because but because God has given me the solution tell somebody and say don't fight me 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 Tell somebody and say, don't fight, me. don't fight me. You might be fighting your president. Tell somebody and say, if you fight me like this, you might be fighting your president. If you carry one like this, you might be arrested also. There was a man who was a king of Egypt, his name is Pharaoh. One day, he had the same mentality of Balak. He realized that the nation of Israel is growing bigger every day. So he wanted a solution to stop them from growing. The Bible said he went to the midwives and said, if any Hebrew woman gives birth to a boy, kill that boy. 
And because they feared God, the Bible said, they never carried out his instruction. They rather lied to him and say, before we can help them when they give birth, they give birth easily because they feared God. They understood that this Hebrews that we are hating now, that we are seeing now, and we are mistreating now, these people might be our solution tomorrow. So they decided to lie to the king and say, they give birth easily. So the ones that we have to help are your people Egyptians. The Bible said they started to grow and grow. So God saw their hearts and so they are did. The Bible said God blessed them and gave them their own households. So when you are fighting the right battle, you are on the side of God. The moment you fight the wrong battle, you are on the side of the, of the devil, of the enemy. Can I show you another thing? Moses, God disapproved his marriage of marrying an Ethiopian woman. Aaron and Miriam, who were like siblings to him, they also disapproved. So, if you check this, they are taking the side of God. Hallelujah. And Moses now is standing alone with the one he loves. But God punished Aaron and Miriam. So sometimes, when people speak against and fight, if you are also part of it, when there is any curse come, you are part of the curse. And if there is any blessing which comes, you can be part of the blessing. The Bible says, God came to them and said, you three, if you read that verse, you'll see, it says, you three, come out of the tent and stand here in front. The Bible says, God descended with it loud and said to Aaron and Miriam, and Moses was there listening. He said, you are fighting my servant that I approved. If there is any prophet in Israel, in the whole world, in the whole earth, that I have to speak to, I use dreams, I use visions. But with my servant Moses, I speak with him mouth to mouth. So who are you to criticize my approved? Tell somebody and say, don't criticize people who are approved by God. Don't fight people who are approved by Jehovah. You might be punished and no one can remove that case. So the Bible said the skin of Miriam changed to be white. Same time. And Aaron had to ask Moses and Moses said, he said to Moses, please ask God to remove this case from my sister. You know, when I read the verse, I was asking myself, why God punished Miriam and left Aaron? I realized that if both of them had the leprosy, no one was going to be able to speak for another. So God punished this one. Maybe this one was having a case which we can't see. This one was, was having the visible one. So he was able to plead, to say, please ask Almighty God to pray so that this one can be healed. There was a man of a certain city called Gerah in the book of Genesis, where Abraham went to him when in Canaan, where Abraham was, there was a famine. He said, I will go to Gerah, to King Abimelech, to ask for food. But I will say to them, Sarah is my sister. The Bible says, when he reached there, because Sarah was beautiful, King Abimelech took Sarah. And he was sure that I'm taking this woman to be my wife because she is not married. 
So when he was sleeping, the angel of God came and said, if you touch this wife of a husband, there shall be death in the whole Abimelech era. The Bible said, he said to him, return her back to the husband. And he answered, he said, God, but he said to me, it's my sister. That's why I took him. The Bible said, because of Sarah, God closed the wombs of all the women in Gera. So there was a case. I, I want us to look at this. Abraham lied. Am I right? To say, she's my sister. Then Abimelech took care. And God punishes Abimelech and leave the one who sinned first. Can you see that? So when you fight the servants of God because they are wrong in your eyes, God cannot punish them because they are wrong. God will cover their mistakes and punish you. There are people who are supposed not to be criticized. The very same thing happened to Isaac. Isaac was the son of Abram, remember? So he had also a challenge of famine. The Bible said it was not the same famine, but this one was like the second after his father's famine. So he also went to Abimelech and said, I'm here for food. And Rebecca is my sister. They took Rebecca to be their wives. And one day the Bible said, King Abimelech of Gera also saw Rebecca and the husband spotting each other. He saw them through a window. So he called him and said, Why, Isaac, you said, This one is your sister. That's why I'm taking her. She said, No, I was afraid that you can kill me for her. Still, there was a case. Tell somebody and say, I don't want a case. I don't want to fight a wrong battle. I don't want to criticize anyone. I think there are two kinds of appointments which we have to be careful about. The enemy is ready to appoint people who must talk against, who must fight. And God is also raising the army. I'm talking about in our last days now, in our dispensation. God is raising army who is appointing. You remember the verse that says we must pray because labors are few, but the harvest is too much? That's what God is doing. He's raising the standard. And here the devil is also appointing people to criticize, to speak again, to fight these ones whom God is raising. Tell somebody and say, be careful. Be careful. And be on the right side. When the case came to Abimelech, imagine, I don't know how big it was, Gera. Imagine every lady, everyone who was there, who is, who is married maybe, is ready to have children, and God will close the womb of that person because of Sarah. It's not painful. Check your life. What are you facing? Who are you fighting? Ask somebody and say, who are you fighting? Who are you criticizing? Because there are people that you are not supposed to speak against. A wrong battle. Tell somebody and say, a wrong battle. Don't fight the wrong battle. Jesus is coming back very soon. And when he comes, he must find me on the right side. Not on the left side, but on the right side. On the right side. Say on the right side. Not on the left. I don't want to be left behind. 
Hallelujah. Amen. Let us read the last verse we close. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew what? Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins who took their lambs and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Verse 2 says, And five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones, when they took their lambs, they did not take the spare oil. Hallelujah. Verse 10. I want to jump some verses. Let's read verse 10. And while they went away to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready, have you seen the verse? And those that were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, came also the virgin, other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. I want to repeat verse 10. And where, while they went away to buy, they went away from the presence of God. They went away from the truth. They went away from doing the right thing. They are fighting the wrong battle. Their bridegroom came and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was shut. Tell somebody and say, the door is about to be closed. Make sure you are inside. The Bible says, the foolish ones, they went away to buy. Went away. To do what? To buy. When they are away, remember here, there was no something like registration whereby they registered their names. That when the bridegroom comes, even if they are away, he can still remember them when they knock at the door. They just went away. To buy and it's not the fault of God it's their fault because when they took oil they forgot or they did not consider to take the spare when they went away the bridegroom came when he came to enter the house he closed and locked the door when they come back they are knocking. Lord, Lord, please open for us. He said, I don't know you. Go to the king you were saving away. One day, when Jesus was relaxed with his disciples and the multitude that were following him, they came a report and said, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. Jesus said, I don't know them. My brothers and my mothers are these ones who are here. You know why? Because the door is locked. If Jesus can go outside, what about the sheep which is inside? it will be lost. He must stay here and you choose to come and join us and join the Lord. When you come and join him here, you become part of him. If you can remember the day Roman soldiers came to arrest Jesus, they did not even know who Jesus was. Judas was supposed to give them a sign to say, the one I kiss is the one. They were looking alike. When you are a soldier, you have to put the right uniform. And all of us, we put the same uniform. 
so that we look alike. We fight one battle. When you are on the other side, when I shoot, I must not shoot you. I will recognize you by the uniform. So, why are you here but wearing the wrong uniform? You need repentance. Come and repent. Run forward. Run forward now if you want to repent. You are here. You are talking. You are fighting the ministry. You are talking against. You are not part of this place. But you are still here wearing a wrong uniform. What kind of soldier are you? You need what? I'm waiting for you. I count seven. One. Two. I'm giving you a chance. If you want to receive Jesus. Jesus is coming back. You are here. You know there is something which is called churching. I'm churching. And there are those who are saying I'm fellowshipping. There are those who know the truth, but they don't do it. There are those who do not know how to do the truth because they don't know it. There are those who do not know where they stand. You are here, but you are fighting against. You are here fighting the wrong battle. Stand up, my sister. You are here, but no, you do not belong here. I'm not talking about charis. I'm talking about the kingdom of God. Are you sure all of you, you are on the right track? I said I'm counting. Two, three, four, five. There are others I can pick and say, are you sure? You, are you sure? Why did you say one, two, three yesterday? Why are you fighting the wrong battle? Can I pick them? Yes. Eh? Yes. When they be offended, I will be offending them because the Bible says offenses must come, but I must not bring it. Five, six, Seven. God bless you. Clap hands for them. <laughs> Lift your hands up. Say, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. I was not aware, was not aware. That, I'm that I'm around, but not doing the right thing. The right thing. Thank, you for new life. Thank you for new life. In Jesus' name. Lord, Lord, we bless your name, bless your name. For, my for my own salvation. Thank you, Jesus, Thank you, Jesus. For, your for your mercy and grace. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. God bless you.